You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Happy Saturday, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I was quite shocked this morning. I didn't know the sun was going to, or the, excuse me, the snow was going to start last night. I woke up and had like five inches outside. So please be careful. Luckily, it looks like it's not laying much on the streets, but, but please be careful. Uh, you know, Knoxville is the birthplace and uh, it was the first capital of the state of Tennessee. It was the site of Tennessee's first newspaper and first published books. It's been the home since 1794 of one of America's oldest state universities, of course, the University of Tennessee. It, has, it also has significant associations with the evolution of country music, the conservation movement, civil rights, politics, and several interesting industries. Knoxvillians have run for president, made major motion pictures, designed very interesting buildings, painted great pictures, and won Pulitzer Prizes. Our guest this morning is a great friend of the show. Jack Neely is a journalist who has been writing about Knoxville since the 1990s. He is the executive director of the Knoxville History Project, where he and his team spend their time archiving Knoxville's history and offering ways for visitors and residents alike to get to know Knoxville's fascinating past. Uh, it's always so interesting to visit with you, Jack. Good morning, and welcome back to More Living. Yeah, yeah. morning, Jim. It's good to be here. And that was a, that was a good uh, summation of, of Knoxville history. I, 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 might, uh, I might take that down and use it myself. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> um, Jack, this year we're celebrating the 40-year anniversary of the 1982 World's Fair. That's that right. was here in Knoxville. Now, my understanding, you were an Egyptian museum tour guide during the World's Fair. What was it like being part of the event? That's right. I, I was. Uh, I spent the first four months of the fair in crowd control, and that might be surprising to anybody that knows me. But um, but the uh, last uh, they they kind of phased that out and needed some help at at Egypt. So I, I suddenly became a an expert on Egyptian, ancient Egyptian history, he became a museum uh, tour guide uh, for the last couple of months of the fair, and it was it was it was fun. It was fascinating. The whole thing was uh, it, it, the fair was a thousand things every day, so it, it's really hard to to. And some of it was really silly, but some of it was some of it was really interesting, and some of it was important. You know uh, that, uh, that we're trying to look uh, at back at it historically and see was history made in Tennessee and as, as the old jingle went uh, across the nation in 1982. Uh, uh, if you want to see how history is being made in Tennessee, you've got to be there is what they were saying. And I know I'm, I'm, my, my uh, mission is uh, in the next couple of months is to, to figure out uh, what history was made there. Um, but it was, you know, a lot of people came, 11 million people came to it, one of the most successful World's Fairs in terms of, of, of hitting its goals uh, in uh, in our lifetimes. Um, and I think the, the next to last World's Fair in America, perhaps in in, in history. Um, so it's, uh, but we would like to find out what, you know, what, what did it actually accomplish? Uh, so, and we haven't completely answered that question yet. Well, and, and and isn't that when we got the nickname the Scruffy City? Uh, yeah, in the preparation for that, yeah, back in uh, two years before the fair, I, a uh, I think it was a Wall Street Journal reporter uh, came here and and said, uh, you know, what if they gave it Wall's Fair and nobody came? That was the headline, uh, and uh, and and she said, you know, Nossel is just a, a scruffy little city on the Tennessee River. Um, and she came here, and it wasn't very impressive to look at, frankly, in 1980. I don't I blame her for saying that, but I have actually tried to get in touch with that 
reporter over the years and, and have, uh, without success, but, uh, but, but uh, you <laughs> don't know what she started once you use that one word, the choice of one word yeah. cascade over the years. And now, now people say keep nostrils scruffy. It's, uh, it's kind of a, become a sort of a battle cry. Now, the downtown area, Jack, has really been in a process of, of revitalization over the past few decades. And one of the buildings that has been renovated, of course, is that old J.C. Penney building, which is now home to Maple Hall Bowling. Ta- tell us a little bit of the history of that building. Yeah, well, it's very similar to the history of the buildings on that block, uh, which is uh, makes it different from other any other block in Knoxville history, because that was the, the site of the worst fire in Knoxville history in 1897. And uh, all those buildings are exactly the same age because uh, they were built, many of them literally later the year of the fire. The fire just devastated, you know, just burned down all those buildings. And, uh, and they called that and, back uh, then, they called it a million dollar fire, right? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, uh, sounded impressive back then, but now uh, I think uh, just a few square foot is a million dollars. Yeah. And then now, but but it was, uh, yeah. I think they were kind of proud that it was uh, that there was that much merchandise uh, lost. Um, of course, that would be uh, many, many millions uh, uh, calculated for inflation. But but uh, but it was a, it was a it was mainly a, a wholesale house uh, section of town, and and they were kind of really pretty fancy wholesale houses there. They had. Uh, uh, like China shops, and uh, you know, the, and this was for like a uh, for the you know, typically for the whole southeast, or even for the whole nation, that people would that these wholesale houses would supply stores uh, throughout America, but especially the southeast. Most of these stores had you know multi-state uh, markets, and uh, uh, but that was what was there early. Uh, J.C. Penney uh, moved into a couple of these wholesale houses, kind of joined them together. And uh, in the 1930s, and a lot of people remember J.C. Penney. I, I do. We used to go downtown and, and shop for shoes and things there. But um, uh, th- but that was one of them, and and that was back in the days when J.C. Penney himself would would visit the stores once a year. So he was he was the very the man himself was was there. And, and of course, J.C. Penney was one of the last uh, last department stores to to finally close downtown uh, after long after Sears had left and so forth. J.C. Penney was still there until the 80s, and uh, and that block was such a dilemma. I, m- I remember when I first began reporting in the 90s uh, for Metropolis, that was that was considered the the problem block downtown because there were all these giant old buildings that all had had condition issues, and people were just shaking their heads and saying, "I don't know what we can do with this block." But uh, but just piece by piece by piece by piece. Look what's happened. It's all those buildings are occupied now, and the people live there. People shop there. People uh, entertain themselves there. The, the restaurants and things, and it's uh, uh, it's just it's been a big success story as as has most of downtown. Jack, anytime you're revitalizing an area, and it's just amazing, uh, the, you know, how far Knoxville's come even in just the last twenty years with our downtown area. But anytime yeah. you're revitalizing any area, what you know, talk about the attention that needs to be paid to, you know, you've got historic buildings and you want to incorporate that to some degree and, and the importance of renovating instead of just demolishing and balancing that line to where you get something that's revitalized but still recognizes our history. Yeah, yeah. And it turns out that that's good for, for business too, it seems like. there there's, there's uh, I've talked to developers downtown and they say there's more interest in People wanted to live in in pre-war buildings, that is pre-World War II buildings uh, downtown, and that's been the those have been the easiest buildings to sell. Uh, they're renovated ones because people like the place with character and and uh, and stories. Uh, I mean, a lot of people do, uh, but it's a uh, but that's been kind of one of the big drivers. I think most of I think actually most of the new businesses downtown. I mean, uh, most I mean eighty or ninety percent of the new businesses downtown. Are in old buildings in pre-1940 buildings, um, and that goes for you know we mentioned Maple Hall. It's it's uh, Maple Hall is a lot of people know is the name of a bowling alley that was put in uh, there about uh, six seven years ago now, um, and uh, but that I mean it's very popular. We we do our our presentations there once a month. Uh, every second Tuesday we do a we do a show at Maple Hall, and uh, it's they have a restaurant kind of above the the bowling and it's, it's perfect because you can hear the bowling, but it's not, it, it, it's kind of like the ocean in the background or something. So it kind of adds, adds something to the, to, to the atmosphere of the place. 
but it's a very nice restaurant with a bar, and, and we have we have slideshows there once a month that are free to the public, open to the public, and, and you're welcome to come join us and actually have supper or a few drinks or whatever while you you learn. Uh, we, we talk about Nostal history, so yeah. Uh, but it, it's yeah, fascinating. But, but, yeah, yeah. But, but history, just, I mean, it, it's – yeah, go ahead. Well, well, I was just going to say it's so fascinating. Go ahead to finish that thought, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the uh, the way that uh, historic preservation uh, and with the, which comes with tax credits and so forth, uh, and uh, kind of combines with the popularity of these things, I think it's it's worked uh, just hand in glove very well downtown over the last uh, over the last thirty years, really. And uh, I tell you what, we're going to get to our first break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about a bloody shootout that happened in the late 1800s that really sounds like it was straight out of the mafia almost the way it sounds. So uh, we'll visit more and talk about the interesting history with Jack Neely, so don't go away. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan. You can hear us every Saturday morning, 9 to 10 a.m. and again, 3 to 4 p.m. You can also check catch all of our podcasts of our show Online, go to BroganFinancial.com and click on radio. We're visiting this morning with Jack Neely with the Hit Knoxville History Product Project. He's an old-time friend of the show and uh, just does so much for the community in helping us remember our history. And I, w- I mentioned there before the break, Jack, but, you know, one of the things, you talk about these monthly sessions you have there at Maple Hall, um, yeah. and I know last summer you talked some about uh, Knoxville's history with a bloody shootout there on the 600 block of Gay Street. Can you, and, and when I was reading about that, it almost, it just, it, I felt like I was, you know, in New York or Chicago reading about the mafia. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean it was mafia related, but can you talk a little yeah. bit about that shootout? Yeah, yeah, that, that's not a, that, that's a pretty apt comparison, actually. The, the, well, there were actually several, uh, <laughs> every time someone asked, asked me about, tell us about the shootout. I always, I always say which shootout. Well, the one on Gay Street, you know, and and uh, and I said, well, which one on Gay Street? <laughs> because they, oh. there were so many. We actually have a, a partner, Laura Still, who does just a shootout tour, and you can take a tour of downtown and look at all the places where the shootouts happen. But uh, but the most famous uh, or infamous shootout in Knoxville history, and I think it compares to anything that ever happened in the in the Wild West, uh, was. In 1882, and that was the Mabry, Mabry O'Connor uh, shootout, uh, in which uh, uh, Thomas O'Connor, bank president, was standing in front of his bank, a uh, building that's much mod- modified but still there today. And this is one of the one of the advantages of, of uh, historic preservation is that these things are still there, and you can point to them and say, "This is this is the same it's pretty wild. same place where this has happened." Because if you if you go down. Uh, Gay Street, just near the on the same block as the Tennessee Theater, there's a building called Mechanics Bank and Trust, and it's uh, it's been used for other purposes since then. But it was in 1882, it was a bank, um, and uh, the president was this guy Thomas O'Connor. He was this, this young uh, millionaire who who'd, uh, who'd been involved in lots of industries, but uh, uh, like a lot of people, were also involved in banking. Um, but uh, but he had a had a had a had a what I want to say feud, but a a disagreement at least with uh, with Joe Mabry, who was another prominent Knoxville businessman. He was in his fifties at this time, and uh, they had had a, an argument of some uh, speculative nature at the racetrack, the horse racing track, uh, the day before, and uh, and apparently uh, O'Connor uh, Mab- uh, O'Connor had said to Mabry, uh, well. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you later, but you just better not walk by my bank at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Where's that effect? And, of course, Mabry being uh, kind of a, a contentious sort of uh, aggressive guy, it, that's exactly what he did. He went by uh, armed in front of his uh, this, uh, this guy's bank, and O'Connor was there waiting for him, and O'Connor let him have it with his shotgun. And uh, Mabry, I think, fell before he could draw, but didn't. O'Connor didn't realize that Mabry's son was was there also uh, half a block away and had witnessed it, and he he returned fire on O'Connor, 
as O'Connor shot at him too. So all three men were killed simultaneously. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, about 11 bystanders were wounded. That's one part of the story that's not always uh, that I, that I always mentioned. But uh, but this was uh, kind of made national headlines, and in a way that not, it was Knoxville didn't like at all. It was it was considered kind of a, a big uh, black eye for the city's <laughs> public image. Uh, but but this was something that uh, you know, three uh, the, the, the body count was the same as the gunfight OK Corral, which was a year earlier. Uh, and th- but this I think is very much in the whole tradition of of the Wild West uh, uh, kind of kind of shootout era, which really lasted. I think it was may have been related to the kind of post-traumatic era you know, after the Civil War. From from 1865 to about 1905, we saw just lots of lots of men who were educated men who knew better uh, end up shooting each other uh, in the street uh, in, of downtown That's Knoxville. amazing. It's just wild yeah. to think that that happened. I mean, I understand, but, you know, but, you know, you don't, when you, when you see those things about the Wild West, you don't think of them as, as we had a lot of that happening right here in Knoxville. Hey, yeah, let's pivot yeah. a little bit. Let's talk about our military history, Jack, because each battle or exchange made Knoxville what it is today. Is there a mm-hmm. particular battle that you think even changed the, traje- the trajectory for Knoxville as a city? Well, that's a good question. The, uh, of course, the only real battle we had here in, in Knoxville was the uh, Battle of Fort Sanders in, in, uh, in November of 1863. Um, and that was uh, that was a, a this is always surprising to people that was a, a, a federal defense against a, a, a Confederate um, a siege uh, which had, had commenced a few weeks before that um, between uh, Long Street on on the Confederate side and Burnside uh, in in, uh, in Knoxville um, but this was uh, the Confederates had had control of Knoxville for for the first two years of the war had uh, evacuated to uh, perhaps hastily to uh, help with uh, the the, 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 the uh, battle down in Chickamauga, and uh, that uh, it was it was after that that they didn't realize the, how quickly the Union Army would sweep in and, and occupy the city, and they were pretty much welcomed by, by a lot of the people who who, uh, who lived here um, and uh, who helped them build the fortifications around the city, which were. Uh, Formidable. Uh, in fact, Sherman came here a few weeks later and said, "This is the best defended city I've ever seen. This is good, good, good job, folks." But we still do have some of the you know, traces of this. Fort Sanders is 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 completely gone, um, uh, but it was it really redeveloped as as Knoxville's you know, you know one of Knoxville's nicest neighborhoods after the Civil War. And uh, uh, then, uh, but then there are still some some battle works, mainly on the south side of, of the city, uh, Fort Dickerson and Fort Higley, which is now a, a great place to visit. High Ground Park over there. I'm like, I hope people have they've seen that. It's a just a wonderful little, uh, I guess, a military park. And uh, and Fort Stanley, I think, there's just barely some you know some barely recognizable remnants there. I think you have to be kind of a <laughs> kind of Civil War. Uh, uh, expert to even notice what's over there but but Fort Dickerson is what pretty well preserved for a, for an earthworks from 160 years ago um, and uh, and and high ground parks a great place to, to see too but that I guess is the is is the gist of how how uh, how, how battles have, have have connected with Knoxville history we're visiting with Jack Neely of the Knoxville History Project and talking about all the great things Knoxville. It's just fascinating, all the different things that have happened in our history. You know, Jack, Knoxville's been the birthplace of many small businesses, large and international businesses, including, of course, Pilot Flying J, Team Health, Scripps Network, and Radio <coughs> Systems Corp. What businesses or industries do you think have had the greatest impact on shaping Knoxville, not just today, but even in the past you know, half century or even century. Yeah, I might even push it farther than than that. Say so that you know, really after the Civil War is when Knoxville became a, kind of an industrial and wholesaling center, 100, 150 years ago uh, or so. But but these were this was the origin of lots of uh, of of uh, first we had the Knoxville Iron Company, which is still st- sort of kind of in business, not under that name, but it's a it's a international steel. Uh, Corporation that's now in Lonsdale, a big factory there, um, which has direct lineage to the post-Civil War Knoxville Iron Company. 
but Nossel has been really uh, uh, diverse in its uh, its industry and, and economy since since that 1870s era, and uh, and that there was a time that we were we had iron, but we also had marble. We were the marble city, and that this was a, yep. marble was a big deal. And suddenly, uh, they were shipping marble to Washington and New York to build the you know the monumental uh, buildings in those cities. Um, but also, uh, new ideas were coming along all the time, and um, there were. Uh, but uh, in, in in the early 20th century, you had people like Weston Fulton, who invented this device that most people would, wouldn't recognize if they saw it, but is elemental to many uh, air conditioning and all sorts of things. But he called it the sylphon. Uh, they, I think they have other terms for it now. The flexible metal bellows is what it was. And uh, and this he made made the Fulton plant, which later some people remember as Robert Shaw later, which was next to uh, next to UT campus uh, in the area where University Commons is now. Um, in fact, the, it's 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 out of the University Commons building, it looks sort of like the old Fulton plant, even though it was it was completely torn down, probably 15 or 20 years ago. Um, but th- then, of course, the one of the big crazy successes is George Dempster, who had a uh, he was a civic leader, was actually you know city manager and later mayor um, of Knoxville was a prominent guy here anyway. But but in 1936, I think it was, he uh, he, he had he was in charge of something called Dempster Brothers uh, Company. He was just a guy who didn't have a college degree. He had worked in Panama and just had this in, this idea about uh, the importance of moving large amounts of, of unwanted waste in, in, in Panama, looking at the canal and you know, taking these you know giant loads of dirt and rock and and where do you put it? And he came up with this idea for a portable container to move uh, waste around, and uh, and he he invented the very first dumpster. Uh, and these were this was introduced in Knoxville, and uh, he he made they were made in Knoxville and and actually advertised here, and he advertised them just by putting them out and seeing seeing if people would use them, and they he put them out in the in the alleyway between uh, Gay Street and Market Street uh, in 19, I think the, w- during the holiday season, 1936, and they were a big hit. Everybody loved having a place to put, you know, their their garbage without, you know, just having paper bags and waiting for the garbage man to come. And uh, and this was it was it was great. And people, mayors, uh, you know, city managers from all over the country came to Knoxville to see how this amazing dumpster thing worked. And uh, and and you know, this idea of, of, of it, it seems so simple, but it, and I do a big, a big sturdy bin uh, but that that has hooks and it has you know things on it that you can hook a, a truck into it and move that bin and dump it out and bring it back and it's empty again. Um, but this was for 50 years or so. They were all made in Knoxville and they were made in on the north side over off uh, off North Central. Um, so this was a that was a big deal, um, and and you can oh, see yeah. to this day if you go to if you go to Singapore you'll, you'll see dumpsters there they, they're all over the world and they call them dumpsters, and George Dempster named them for himself. <laughs> so the dumpster. I did dumpster. not know that. That's a rather that's a fascinating yeah. story. Yeah. Tell, tell yeah. you what, um, we're visiting with Jack Neely with Knoxville History Project. When we come back, I want to talk some about Knoxville's music heritage. Also, we'll have our dollars yeah. and cents segment, and I'm I'm going to talk about one of the biggest mistakes that you need to prevent making um, when in your financial plan, especially in periods of market instability like we are in right now. So don't go away. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. We're right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI every Saturday morning, 9 to 10 a.m., and again from 3 to 4 p.m., We also publish a great deal of information online. Go to broganfinancial.com. If you click on radio, you can listen to all of our podcasts of our shows and our dollars and cents segments and the retirement minutes that we run every week on this station. Uh, You can also download some great resources by clicking on our resources page. Today, we're visiting with Jack Neely. Uh, Jack is, of course, with the Knoxville History Project. He's been a great friend to all of Knoxville for so long sharing such great information. Uh, Before we get back to Jack, however, it is time for dollars and cents. 
Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. We're going to talk about one of the biggest enemies, one of the biggest threats to successful financial planning, and it's one word, emotion. Trading or handling finances with emotion. And that's particularly important in times like this. Things are volatile in, in the entire world right now. We anticipated choppiness and volatility this year uh, because of all the challenges coming out of COVID, inflation, Federal Reserve tightening policy, uh, which was expected. And, and then, of course, we, we couldn't have foreseen Russia going into Ukraine uh, and, and being like this, but, but that's just exacerbated the issue. But we have to be very careful how we handle our finances during these kinds of times. So we have to prepare that we're going to have these types of market downturns. Now, right now, we've entered correction territory a couple of times this year. We are not in a bear market. Will it become a bear market? I don't know. But I have an interesting chart here that I'm looking at that we just put out in our guide. We have a guide out, uh, Five Keys to Retirement Planning in 2022. You can download that guide on my website. Uh, you can also uh, download, I did a, an on-demand webinar. So if you go to our website, broganfinancial.com, and click on uh, resources, you can pull that up. But this is looking at the growth. If you invested $10,000 on January 1st of 1980, and just put it in the S&P 500 and let it sit there for 40 years. It would have grown to almost $700,000 over that 40-year period. However, what if you had been out of the market on the best five days of the market? Instead of having almost $700,000, you would have a little less than $450,000. Just for those five days. And if you were out of the market on the best 10 days, you, you'd have a little less than 350000 as opposed to almost seven hundred. You'd literally have just a little over half of the amount of money if you'd been out of the market for t the 10 best days. And so what happens is people time the market a lot of times based on emotion. And that can be so dangerous. Let's look at what just happened two weeks ago when Russia went into Ukraine. It happened on a Wednesday night here in the United States, and on Thursday morning when we woke up and when the markets opened at 9.30 Eastern time, the stock market was down over 700 points on the Dow Jones, uh, almost 2%. By the end of the day, it was in the green. And then on Friday, it went up over 800 points, over 2%. Who would have thought that that would have happened? Emotionally, it would be easy in those moments to sell at the sign of potential disaster. Things can often turn on a dime. Something unexpected could happen either for the good or for the bad. So instead, the way we need to handle moments like this is we need to be evaluating the risk and reward or the risk and return metrics in our portfolio. How much risk are you taking? What should you expect in a down market? And how can you structure income in retirement so that you don't get impacted by the market downturns? You don't have to sell out of the market when it is sharply down in order to generate income. So the way your income plan and investment plan fit together is so critically important. And then how you measure risk that you don't get, you know, we never know the future when it comes to risk investing. But measuring past risk and, and return is a pretty good future, a pretty good predictor in the future. In other words, not when is the good market or when is the bad market and how much will you make. It's more when we have a bear market, what, what typically could you expect? You can have a, a, a rough idea. And yeah, you can always get an anomaly. But if you plan for these things ahead of time and you have a well-designed and, and comprehensive financial plan, then you don't panic when we have those moments. Now, it's not too late. If, you, if you've not developed a plan like that, 
yeah, we're in the midst of some choppiness and volatility, but the reality is we had a huge market surge the last five years up until this year. So there are still plenty of things you can do to get the right type of balance in your portfolio to structure yourself for stability of income in the short term, but then just as importantly have growth of income in the long term to fight inflation. That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting BroganFinancial.com. Do please check us out at BroganFinancial.com and you can download all of our materials. Uh, that's why we put them up in there and that's why I do this show so you can make informed and prudent decisions that can impact the quality of your life. This morning, we're visiting with Jack Neely. He's with the Knoxville History Project. It's always so fascinating when we visit with Jack. Jack, I, you know, we, when we think of East Tennessee mu and music, we think, you know, first we think of Dolly Parton, who, of course, right nearby in Sevierville. <laughs> but there are other musicians that have made a great impact that are from here as well. What other, or who are some other famous musicians who have called Knoxville home? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say there are there. In fact, uh, uh, going back to uh, in fact, going back to the business issue, uh, Sturkey Brothers Furniture interestingly played a major role in the early development of country music because they sold phonograph machines and they and they thought, gosh, we have phonograph machines just like all technology. It became cheaper and cheaper as the years went by as they got better at, at mass producing them. Uh, but they said, gosh, working people aren't buying. Our phonograph machines, and they realized, well, why? Because the only thing out there was like opera and stuff like that that they that working people didn't care about having in their home. Uh, and uh, and James Turkey said, well, why don't we start uh, uh, recording some of these street musicians? We we walk around them all the time, and they're you know these fiddlers, many of them blind people making you know making with a tin cup collecting uh, nickels. Uh, why don't we record them and see what happens? And they actually did some of that up in New York. They sent some of these Knoxville street musicians to New York in 1924-25, and uh, and they made records and and they they sold them. You know, it was they didn't become superstars, but the, this was kind of the beginning of country music recording. Um, but later on, about in the 20s, Knoxville was still listening mainly to pop music and it was mostly jazz. And early into the early 30s, it was really uh, in 1935. This there was a sudden phenomenon called Roy Acuff, and he was a guy that a, a kid who had lived in in, in Fountain City. He was a uh, he was he'd gotten in a lot of trouble. He'd been arrested several times. He'd been shot once. He was just he was a tough guy, and and he was a bootlegger. He was a gambler. He was he was involved in all sorts of stuff. Um, but he learned to play the fiddle and uh, was uh, was pretty good at it finally and. And not only what, could he play the fiddle well, but he had this uh, charisma to him, and he would do like uh, do unusual things on stage, like make a train sounds with his voice and things like that. And he was just became kind of a, a cultural hero, and uh, compared to punk rock in a way, because it was, he was kind of shocking in 1935. Him and a, a band called the Crazy Tennesseans, uh, and uh, it just suddenly th this was the first time that there was a really popular phenomenon of country music you know country music gets kind of been around it was something associated with your great uncle or something playing fiddle in the barn or something but uh, but this was suddenly a, a, a mass phenomenon of, you know a thousand people come to see Roy Acuff perform at Market Square or at, at this old boxing ring on on, uh, on Gay Street and he, they were actually evicted from the Andrew Johnson Hotel because they were you know attracting too many rowdies but this was, uh, you know, suddenly a thing, and he, he introduced this thing called the dobro, uh, which nobody had ever heard of. This kind of otherworldly sort of sound. It was really unusual, and, and it was a, it, a West Coast invention that had never really caught on anywhere until Roy Aka put it into his band. And um, but, but he became, you know, by 1938, he was in Nashville at the Grand Ole Opry, and and, and really created kind of in some way created country music as a national phenomenon. I did and, not uh, know when, that the that that Roy Acuff was really the person that was most instrumental in the uh, in the evolution of the dobro into country music. I, that's amazing. I never knew that. Yeah, I, I, I learned that a few from a bluegrass magazine a few years ago, and I found out that there was this guy named Quill Summy who was from the Smoky Mountains who who, who loved the dobro, and he began uh, uh, playing it, and they they took it to. And this is what made that the, the Great Speckled Bird was their first big hit, and that was the dobro is what made the Great Speckled Bird kind of an unusual an unusual record. 
but after Roy Acuff went to Nashville, right after uh, a young kid from Union County, uh, Chet Atkins, uh, came here and was, he was originally a fiddler and then began playing guitar and was really trying to play jazz guitar. But he it was, uh, Chet later said in his memoirs that it was his, his attempts to sound like Django Reinhardt, uh, the, you know, the uh, you know, European jazz instrumentalist. Uh, that that made that created his own his own sound that was unlike anybody else's um, and uh, he of course he became a big deal and, and then after you know after that by the late 1930s early 40s we had country music radio live radio um, and the you know, midday merry around started around that time and, and which was kind of inspired by Roy Acuff's uh, uh, mm-hmm. sudden success. And uh, and this became just you know, for about 20 years, 25 years, I guess, ending. Dolly Parton was really the last uh, live radio star to to uh, to make it big uh, from from here. And, and of course, live radio kind of club uh, music radio. We still have live talk radio, but live music radio kind of ended by the early 60s. Uh, but then that was kind of the end of that that era. We're visiting with Jack Neely. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit, Jack, about all the things Knoxville History Project does to help people learn more and take in our history. And it's a great way to get involved and just learn more. You know, we got to know our history in order to, to, to pave the path for our future. So stay with us as we visit with Jack Neely with the Knoxville History Project right here on More Living. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. <laughs> Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living. It's chilly outside. Be careful. Look for slick spots on the road. We're visiting this morning with Jack Neely with Knoxville History Project. Just fascinating every time we visit with Jack. Thank you so much, Jack, for taking your time. Uh, I know, you know, there's absolutely, there's a saying that a picture tells a thousand words. And you all have published an historic picture book on downtown Knoxville. Tell us a little bit about the, 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 the process of collecting photos for that picture book. Yeah, that, that's right. That, that was my colleague uh, Paul James's uh, idea, and, and he did uh, lion share of the work on it. But we had put together a, a book of photographs of downtown, and some of them, if you follow Knoxville history at all, you, you might have seen in other books. Some of them are well known, but some of them have never been published before. We found several uh, several interesting pictures of of, uh, of the past that uh, that I think will be you know, surprising to people. Uh, but uh, I think with downtown, so much interest in downtown, it'd be good to have that perspective. This, this is our first. A lot of books we publish are sold. We're kind of like a, a tiny publishing company. Uh, we published, I, I guess, our flagship book is Historic Knoxville: The Curious Visitors Guide, and we've sold thousands of copies of that uh, so far. And I'm glad because I'm really proud of that book. Uh, it's a good, a really good look at the whole city, even if you're not that interested in history. It's kind of a, it's a guide to the city. And what you the, the most interesting parts of the, of the of the place from everything from Neyland Stadium Times Nature Center you know on all the parks and sure. everything else, uh, but uh, but but we we have uh, we we we, we publish those uh, things. But then uh, we did this this uh, picture book about downtown is the first time we worked, dealt with another publisher, and it's a uh, uh, Arcadia, which has uh, uh, kind of a broader reach than we do. When we publish books, we basically Paul, Paul, Paul basically, uh, and, or I carry boxes of books to different places and and and, and mainly local locally owned stores that carry it. We don't deal with the Amazon and all that stuff, but uh, but Arcadia does, and this this is kind of a way to to expand our our reach. I think to people that that may maybe don't shop at uh, at Mass General Store or or, or, or Long Stroke stores in places that we uh, we sell our books. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it, it, we're interested to see what happens with it. Well, and I we think it's a, a great uh, way. I, I love seeing yeah. the old historic pictures. Um, yeah. Probably my favorite picture of Knoxville is this, you know, that shot down, and, and really from different eras. I've seen several of the shots, but from, you know, looking right down Gay Street in the historic Tennessee Theater is just so gorgeous yeah. from seeing, yeah. and, yeah. and seeing it almost like in, in, it almost tells a story as you see Gay Street age over the years. But I think any time, mm-hmm. you know, I, I love looking at picture books, but also love reading about Knoxville. And so you all are always putting out resources. And I know um, 
you put out feature articles and do host regular events. So talk a little bit, Jack, about what's coming up on the calendar for Knoxville History Project. That's true. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do put out uh, uh, feature articles once, usually once a month, uh, and we we send links to them to our donors of, of fifty dollars or more. So if you're or if you're a donor, you get these in the mail. But if if, if not, you'll eventually see them on our website. But our, we have our website, org. And we have hundreds of stories about Knoxville, uh, all researched uh, historical uh, pieces about Knoxville, categorized under different uh, uh, different categories, and lots of pictures. Like, and so go go to our website and see if there's any, if, if we if we can't answer your question on the website, uh, uh, give us a call. But we uh, we do do uh, uh, regular events. Uh, we did uh, the second Tuesday of every month, as I mentioned earlier. We go to Maple Hall, have an in-person event, and you can have a drink and, and watch a slideshow, and then have a discussion about uh, about the subject. Um, um, we actually were talking about that new book when we did one last week. Had a good had a good crowd for it. But we also do Zooms. Uh, we we started this during the early days of the pandemic. Uh, Zoom uh, conferences that, uh, uh, and we did them once a week for a year and a half or so. And then when uh, we said, well, we, we're not doing these anymore, we're going to do live things again. And, and uh, we found out that a lot of people were disappointed. They got, they enjoyed the Zooms and watching, you know, watching these things at home. Some people don't like to come out at night and some people live on the West Coast. We actually have three or four people on the West Coast who, who have some connection to Knoxville who join our Zooms, uh, so obviously they can't come to Maple Hall. But uh, but we uh, this coming week, uh, this uh, Thursday, we do this on the third Thursday, every third Thursday at 6 o'clock. Just come to our website, look under events, and, and, and sign up for Zoom. But this coming Thursday, we're going to be talking about the world's muscle in the World's Fair before the World's Fair. Uh, and this is kind of Surprising to people, we say, "Gosh, what a weird thing it is that Knoxville had Knoxville, Tennessee had a World's Fair in 1982." But in fact, we had lots of connections to World's Fairs before that, going back to the 1870s. Uh, so we're uh, we're going to be talking about some of that, uh, even the ones in Paris. We had Knoxvilleans who were working as commissioners and jurors uh, in the famous World's Fairs in Paris, you know, that created the Eiffel Tower and all that. Sure. So, we'll be, we'll be so I, I guess the. So I guess, Jack, the best way is KnoxvilleHistoryProject.org is the website to find right. out about events. Right. Um, also contribute to a worthy cause, um, and then also, um, you know, just stay completely up to date of, of all the different published. I guess we could buy the books through that site and all that. That's right. That's right. So yeah, KnoxvilleHistoryProject.org. Yeah, got... Jack, sorry, we're yeah. out of time. I hate it. It always yeah. flies by. Thank you for taking time out yeah. of your schedule to visit with us no, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it very much, Jim. Thanks. Absolutely. That's Jack Neely with Knoxville History Project, uh, KnoxvilleHistoryProject.org. It's a great support a worthy cause. Today we've talked about the community of Knoxville because a greater community provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you, Chris, for engineering the show, and thank you to Jill for producing the show. Have a very blessed and safe weekend. This is News Talk, this is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.